feeling into words Feel your heart beat Feel your heart beat with gaps in between where the qualities recede Welcome to Twisted Sage Studios. We're going to learn both the physical and energetic aspects used in creating the tensor ring. A quick background on the rings. Slim Sperling, the world famous geodowser from my beautiful state of South Dakota, discovered and researched the ring technology in the 1980s and 90s. He later referred to these as light life rings. Slim passed on in 2007 and has since worked with those who had listened to get this technology into everyone's hands. I began to make rings in early 2011 after meeting two different people who were creating Slim's tools. When I began constructing rings, there were a few that did not work or put energy out just one side of the ring. There were actually some that we found that were not putting out a healthful and beneficial energy at all. I soon met someone who channeled Slim's purling. I was given both encouragement and technical advice from Slim on constructing the rings. It was at that point that I began to call upon Slim for assistance in the construction of the rings. So, what exactly is a tensor ring? Well, after a bit of research, I found that John Archibald Wheeler, who coined the term black hole, came up with the mathematical theory of the tensor field, which is found inside the ring. Hence, the generic name of tensor ring was born. How does a tensor ring function? Well, a piece of copper wire has a positive and a negative end to it. When looped on itself, it was found that one side put out a beneficial right-hand spin and the other side a not-so-beneficial energy. What Slim discovered was that when a wire is looped back on itself, twisted, cut to a very specific length, and the ends terminated back onto themselves, a tensor field is created. The rings create a counter-rotating vortex and a column of energy in the form of a light wave. This extends for miles. Hans Becker, a scientifically qualified researcher and inventor, found that the ring oscillates at 144 MHz, a harmonic speed of light. Hans stated that the ring may be the simplest, most efficient source of energy there is, gathering it and condensing it from space. Hans also discovered another ring that contained a frequency of 177 MHz, known as the lost cubit. A cubit is a measure of length. The sacred cubit, also known as the pyramid inch, was used as a standard unit of measure throughout the megalithic world. Most of this information can be found in Cal Garrison's book, Slim's Universe. The new book, Dancing with Water, contains some really good information on Slim and his rings as well. I recommend reading both. Let's quickly discuss the size and frequencies of the rings. A sacred cubit is 20.6 inches in length, and rings made from the sacred cubit length emit a frequency of 144 MHz. The lost cubit is 23.49 inches in length, and rings made from the lost cubit length emit a frequency of 177 MHz. These are the two standard lengths used to create working rings. With these two lengths, we can make rings with one half, one quarter, and one eighth fractions of the cubit length. They will contain the same frequency as the full cubit. Other sizes that seem to function are the one and a half and three and a half cubit lengths. We will cover these more in detail for you at the end of the video. Okay, before we begin the physical construction of the tensor ring, we still need to address the energetic side of things. I will do this with a personal story. Earlier in the year, a channeled energy group called the Elders Three introduced us to the symbol of the water elemental, Hedica. This copper tool is also known as a Triscale or Triscalian. We found that while making Hedicas, 
the crystalline structure of copper retain the person's energy and intentions they had while working with the wire. So, as I began to construct the rings, I had twisted the wire while putting in the intentions of love, joy, happiness, strength, etc. I hand twisted a lot of wire before Slim told me to just use a drill. I now call in those spirits and guides who are there for my greatest and highest good to help infuse the wire with healthful and beneficial energies. I feel that what you put into the wire energetically is a very important aspect to the creation of the rings, just as it is with twisting up pedigas. Without any further delay, we will begin part two, the physical construction of the tensor ring. In part three of this video, we will discuss some advanced techniques in the physical construction, such as the use of oxygen and acetylene. After part three, there will be a summary of the information from the video. There will also be another section dealing with setting energy and intentions through the use of some easy meditation and visualization techniques. And I've added a bonus at the end of this video, which is called Making the Elementals. Part 2, The Physical Creation of the Ring For those of you who do not have access to acetylene and oxygen, we're going to start as I started, and that is with a simple propane torch and silver bearing solder. Now, silver bearing solder is not pure silver. It ranges anywhere from 2% to 4% silver. The rest of it is tin. We use a lead-free solder because it is a much stronger bond. In the next half of this video, we will be discussing the use of oxygen and acetylene and doing brazing. You can use the soldered ring for putting around your faucets, uh, putting around your drinking glasses, and things like that. But it's not recommended to use where there is any kind of a tension on the ring, such as wearing the ring, keeping it in your pocket, etc. Uh, it does not work well for creating any spheres or coils. Some of the tools that we will need today is a propane torch, the silver bearing solder should come with flux, steel wool, a pair of side cutters such as a lineman's pliers, a metal file, a vise, and safety glasses, a board that is one inch thick, about two feet long, and about four inches across. We're going to start out with a very easy ring to make and that is a half sacred cubit. And with this one today we are going to use a 14 gauge wire. The board is now going to become a multi-purpose tool. We can start with a fencing staple as pictured or else you can just use a regular nail as well. We'll pound that into one end of the board. Now if you use a staple you can run the wire through it. And if you use a nail, you can just hoop the wire around the nail. A good rule of thumb is to start with about three times the length of wire that you are looking to use. So with our half cubit length today, we will be using approximately 30 inches of wire. We'll make sure that both ends are even. Put a little hook on the ends of the wire, and then we'll crimp them down tight. So that way, they will be able to fit into our variable speed drill. Now we insert the, both the wires into the variable speed drill and tighten it down. Stand on the board and gently pull on the drill as you are spinning it. The direction of the twist on the wire is important as well. We will do a right hand or a clockwise twist on all the wire that we spin. Now this is the part where we work at the wire energetically. We would like to infuse this wire with healthful and beneficial energies. Again, at the end of the video, we will show you some really easy to use meditation and centering techniques. It is very important to be centered and grounded and to be able to call in uh, beneficial energies to assist you in the creation of these tools. And I use my hand as a tool of intention. Basically, all I'm doing is intending energy to enter the wire, you would ask Slim Sperling to be there to help make this a healthful 
beneficial and a working tool. So I keep running energy into the wire with intention as I am twisting it. As you slowly twist it with the drill, it will eventually get tight enough so that the wire breaks off right at your drill tip, as shown here. The wire I would like to be just a little bit tighter, so I will make another little crimp on the end of the wire and reinsert it into the drill. Now I will go slow again, and I will also be putting a little bit of tension on the wire, pulling back with the drill. Now my wire is sufficiently tight, and this is a judgment call to you. I like to have a little bit tighter wrap in my wires. Next we cut off the end that is attached to the staple or the nail. As you can see there are little hatch marks in this board. Now I use a two foot board that way I can put marks on it for both a lost and a sacred cubit and I use the two feet so that way I can fit my full cubits, my half cubits, my quarter cubits and my eighth cubit marks on the board. Next we have one end that is on a hatch mark for our half cubit. The other end hangs off the board. That is the end that we would cut off with our pliers. After we have cut it, you can see that there's just a little bit of an overhang left, which gives us enough room that we can file both ends of the wire flat. So we're not filing our board. We'll flip our board over and use the other end and we will hold down the wire and let it overhang as we file it with our metal file. Once you have both ends flattened, you can hold one end on the hatch mark and the other end at the end of your board. Now you will be able to feel with your finger whether you have filed enough off so that there is no overhang and you will also be able to feel that if you have filed too much off uh, because we would like this a precise length. And if you file too much off, don't worry about it. Throw it in your recycle bucket. All right, now we have both ends that are squared off. Next, we can hand bend the wire into a hoop. You may need to take pliers and gently bend each end of the wire so that you have a nice free flowing circle once the wires are butted together. We then take our fine steel wool and we polish up both ends of the wire. This is the water soluble flux. We do not have to put much flux on the ends. The solder will follow the flux. Put the ring in the vise and have it set in place before coating the joint with flux. Ensure that the joining ends make a smooth arc and the ends are flush together. Do not have a lot of tension on the joint or the ends may slip when heated. And I always like to double check my joint. I like to feel it. Just to feel if that feels right, the connection there. And I'll stop and readjust everything if it just does not feel right. It is an intuitive thing that you will learn. If you touch the joint with your fingers, use steel wool to remove the oils from your fingertips. Flux the tips and be sure to get flux down in the joint between the adjoining pieces. So you want to move the wire a little bit just so that you get flux in between the joint. It goes without saying, follow all safety guidelines set out by the manufacturers of tools and the products, as this is not a safety video and I take no responsibility for anyone's physical well-being while replicating these procedures.
Keep the joint until red hot. Once the joint is hot, remove the flame as you bring in the solder. It will take a bit of practice to get this down right. And as it starts to cool off, we can bring in our steel wool and start to clean the ring. And at this point here, once it started to cool off a little bit, we can double check to make sure that we get a decent strong hold on there. That we have a beautifully soldered ring. If you have an oxygen and acetylene torch, I assume you know how to use it and will not discuss the basics. A small diameter brazing rod is what we are using. You will probably get a flux coated rod, but get the smallest diameter of bronze brazing rod that you can find available. This one appears to be a, about a 14 gauge. And with my bare rod, I will first heat up my brazing rod and then I will dip it into the flux. One benefit of using oxygen and acetylene is there's no need to use steel wool on the joint. And I always like to double check my joint. I like to feel it. Just to feel if that feels right, the connection there. And I'll stop and readjust everything if it just does not feel right. It is an intuitive thing that you will learn. As with all this stuff, it just takes a little bit of practice. You'll have to go through the flame adjustments, and you'll probably burn through many copper rods in your process. So for my bare rods, I'm just going to heat it up enough to where the flux will stick to it. I heat it up and I dip it in a can of flux. And with these 14 gauge rings, you just need to do a quick in and out. And we're going to bring both the flame and the brazing rod in at the same time. And there you go. Right now we have good solid hold. Now we have a little bit of extra brazing that's hanging up on the sides there. It's got a little lump in it. You can just come in and touch that up because that, will, that brazing will follow where the heat goes. So all you have to do is just barely bring it in and touch it up and then you'll get rid of that little bit of a ball there. So there we have it. Bring in our steel wool and clean them up. Take them out of the vise, and there we go. There we have a good, solid, strong brazing. Okay, and you can use your anvil to hammer some of your scraps flat. 
Uh, if you have a piece of twisted wire that's just a little bit too short, you can flatten it out. And one of the benefits of flattening these guys out is that you can make rings with them. Now, this here is a lost cubit. It was made with a 10 gauge wire and is my wedding band. Uh, I really love this ring. What creates a working tensor ring is that the ends of the wire are short circuited back on themselves. So when you go and flatten a wire and you put it together as a ring as such, you want to make sure that your end comes back on itself when it is put into full circle. So what you can do is you can make a mark on this wire and you can follow it down and go every other wire and make a mark down here. Then when you put the hoop together you'll be able to see if it hoops back on itself again such as this ring. Slim also gave instructions that the end of the wire should hoop back on itself on the other end when it comes into a full circle. One way to figure that out is when you're using a thicker gauge wire you can make a mark with a permanent marker on the end of the wire and part way down from the tip. Now once you have that one marked you put your thumbnail right on top of that wire with the mark on it. You put your thumbnail on there and you just twist down and you spiral all the way down to the end. And so you know that the wire that your thumbnail is riding on is the wire with the mark on it. So once you get clear down to the other end you make a mark on the wire that your thumbnail is riding on. Now then, when you bring this hoop together, you'll be able to see whether you are lining up on your marks. Now I have found that when you are working with the smaller 14 gauge wire, that basically you are touching end to end anyway, and we have not found that it really makes any difference in the energies when using these 14 gauge wires. We have found that the rings work whether the ends are butted up exactly or not. I feel that as long as they are making some sort of an electrical connection there then we have short circuited and created the tensor field. And we have found that to be true checking them energetically but I wanted to make sure that I passed on this information to you and an easy technique to find which end matches which end. I would also like to give you some tips on wire. A really great way to get your copper wire is to go to reclamation facilities. Their electricians and linemen throw away all kinds of coils and lengths of wire. What I like to do is to just buy a cable of wire. And there you can unwrap your single strands. And that is a cheap and effective way to upcycle wire. And at the reclamation places you can also get wire that is sheathed. It's a little bit more trouble, but uh, if you find the wire that you're after, you can just cut the sheath off with a good sharp razor knife. And of course you can find various gauges of wire. Here is some really heavy gauge wire that you use to make your three and a half cubits. One reason that it took me a while to put this video out was I was unsure about the healthful and beneficial aspects of the rings that everybody creates. Now I am very fortunate and I have somebody very close to me that does double checking on the healthful and beneficial aspects of the, all these rings and any energy tool that I create. Now the term divination is simply the use of pendulums, the use of L rods or dowsing rods, 
or the use of kinesiology or muscle testing. Within this realm of asking and yes or no answers is also the yes or no answers that you get from your guides and from intuition. Now if you do not do any forms of divination, I suggest that you find somebody that you trust in their skills and abilities to do the divination for you, at least on the first few sets of rings that you make. And if you cannot find anybody to help you with the divination, you can certainly give me a call and I can find somebody for you. Now Slim relied on friends who did this type of energy work as well who had this type of intuitive ability. Pictured on the bottom is our 14 gauge. In the middle is a 10 gauge and the wire on top is an unknown gauge to me. It is what is used in electrical transmission lines. The twisted wire that is pictured on the top is used for our three and a half cubits. The 10 or 12 gauge is used for regular cubits, one and a half cubits, and a half cubits. You can also hammer them flat and use them as eighth cubits. The 14 gauge wire works great for half cubits, quarter cubits, and eighth cubits. You can also hammer them flat to work as eighth cubits. We have found that a 16 gauge or smaller wire just doesn't work well. We have also found that the super heavy wire used in the three and a half cubits does not work well for one and a half or one cubit lengths. And these are some basic guidelines to go by. Feeling into words. Okay, now we're going to discuss the energetic aspect of creating the tensor rings. There's a short and easy meditation here called the Trinity Breath. It's also known as the Earth Sky Meditation. You go through it once, and then you can take a shortcut version in three breaths after that. So when you go to infuse the ring with the healthful and beneficial energies, you can just take the three breaths and you are connected with Mother Earth and Father Sky. That will ground you and help keep you centered. And once you are grounded and centered, it is a good idea to call in those who walk with you, those that are there for your highest and greatest good. And be sure to call in Slim Sperling as well. Slim is very happy to assist in the creation of these tools. The Trinity Breath. Find a quiet place to lie or sit comfortably on the ground. Close your eyes, relax, and just let your everyday thoughts go. Don't worry about anything, and just be in the moment. Forget all else, it'll all still be there, if you want it to be. Just simply focus on your breath. Breathing in through your nose, a deep yet easy breath. Breathe out through your mouth. There is no wrong way to do this. Just breathe deeply and comfortably. Using your imagination, imagine yourself sitting on your favorite place on earth. Visualize a beautiful scene from nature. In your heart, feel the love that you have for nature and for Mother Earth. Now visualize yourself standing in your favorite spot with your arms across your chest. With your arms crossed, spiral downwards into the center of the earth. 
As you spiral down through the earth, you enter a large room. It is lit with a soft glow so you can see. In this room, to your left, there is a lake. As you look around, you will see the spirit of Mother Earth, Gaia. She may appear to you in human form or as an animal, however you perceive the spirit of the earth to look like. She will hand you a ball of energy. Look at the ball and notice the size and color. As you take the ball, thank her. This ball of energy is filled with joy and unconditional love. As you come back to the surface of earth, bring the ball of energy up through your feet, slowly moving up your legs. It is leaving unconditional love from the earth in every cell of your body. Bring the ball up to your hips, your ribs, on up to your chest, leaving unconditional love in every cell of your body. Take the ball of energy on up to your throat, to the top of your head, and on out a few feet above the head. Let it drop back down into the center of your chest. Feel this love radiate through your entire body. Now, turn your attention to the rest of creation. See a night filled with billions of stars. See the moon above. See the beauty of all that is and feel the love that you have for everything. We are now going to fly into this night sky. You look back as Earth moves farther and farther away. You fly past the moon and all the planets in our solar system. As you fly by our sun, feel its warmth on your face. We are going past our sun to the universal sun. We are going to the source of everything, to the central sun of all planets and stars. As we near the source of all matter, we see what appears to be a lake on the left of the universal sun. This is Star Lake. You see a figure. It is the keeper of the lake. He beckons you. Jump in. What appeared as water is actually energy. You can breathe it in like air. You can swim on top of the lake. You can dive into it and effortlessly glide through the lake. You can sit on the edge and dip your feet in. Dolphins and whales can be found here. Swim and play with them. There are even unicorns standing at the edge of the lake. All the creatures of Star Lake are here to share healing energy with you. The water itself is just simply healing energy. It moves through every cell within your body as you breathe it in. Now, as we come back to our body, bring the energies of Mother Earth and Star Lake into your heart area. Imagine a sphere within your chest where this energy comes together. Let that energy swirl there, the energy of three, earth, sky, and you. This combination of earth, sky, you makes you a very powerful person. From the sphere in your chest, allow the energy to form a second sphere which encompasses your entire body. Allow the energy of three to flow and build within the second sphere. You now have two spheres of flowing energy, the one within your chest and the one around your body. From here, allow the energy of three to flow into the world around you. Allow it to flow into the earth, into the sky, into your home, into your life. Allow the energy to just flow. This is a great and powerful energy. Do not give it direction. Simply allow it to flow wherever it is most needed. Focusing on your breath several times during your day will help keep you in your flow. Believe in yourself. As chaos comes to you, it is of great importance to remember to be in the moment. Take the time to take the breath of earth and sky. Take the time to feel the quiet and soothing power of the trinity of you, earth, and sky within your heart. 
bring the three together in your breath is a way of living. To simplify this process, to use during times of stress, imagine that you have roots that come out of your feet and go deep within the ground. Then just breathe. Breathe in the energy of the earth up through your feet and the energy of the sky down through your crown. Mix these two energies in your heart. Feel the peace and completeness as you breathe in these energies. Feel the quiet and soothing power of the trinity of you, earth, and sky within your heart. To find more really simple and easy to use meditations and breathing techniques, you can go to theelders3.com. They bring in some wonderful, easy energy and easy energy is the way to go, hence the tensor rings. I have a website for you to check out. They give free Reiki attunements by distance on a monthly basis. These are very wonderful people that do these and I highly recommend whether you are already studying Reiki or any other form of energy healing, I recommend that you receive a Reiki attunement. It will help you run energy through your hands, and it just opens you up energetically. Now the Elders Three have helped channel in the name of several elementals. The one that we use most is Hedica, the water elemental. Pictured are the copper constructions of the elements, as given by the Elders Three. and presented here is a short video on the construction of the Hedica. Okay, today we're going to make uh, Hedicas or also known as triscales. Uh, triscale is a symbol. It can be found on the Temple Grange in Ireland. There's a lot of other history to it. People have been intuitively making these things for a few decades. Fishermen on the East Coast make them, put them in their holding tanks, keep their fish alive longer. Um, Dancing with Water has done quite a bit of scientific research on these guys and the wonderful things that they do. 
Now, it is a rather profound energy tool, uh, profound in the fact that it does some amazing things with water and with the human body and with plants and with the earth. And it is so simple. We have a piece of copper wire here. You can start with a piece of copper wire that's about 20.6 inches long, and that's a sacred cubit length. You can actually use any length of wire, and it'll always have this energy signature. Now, we bend it in half, but not quite in half. One tail is always longer than the other. Next, where our hoop is, we'll just squish that down a bit so that we have a nice tight ending in our hoop there. Now, we always take our long end and have it on the top. So, with our long leg on the top, we're going to take our pliers, and you can use any kind of pliers. I prefer lineman pliers. And we're going to grab on right in that center. And we're going to bend our long leg up and over. So that it comes up and goes in the opposite direction as our first leg. Now you can play with this over time. But uh, what I've done here is I've just squished that down a little bit to make a nice tight center in the middle. Now then, our long leg... We're going to keep wrapping it over until it is in the same direction as our shorter leg. And you'll notice that it's gotten a little bit shorter because it has a farther distance to go around. Now from here, we're just going to follow one around the other. And we're just going to keep spiraling them around the center. And you'll get a feel of how far to go with these. And I usually go until my ends are about even. Now then, the best way to do this is to take the spiral in your left hand and hold it up facing you. Now then, when you have it facing you, the longer wire will be on top. And with that facing you, we'll take that top wire and we'll bend it towards the central spiral. And we're just making a little hoop here. And we're just going to roll that up until it gets all the way up to that central spiral. So, here we go. I'm just going to roll them on up there. Now, the thing with uh, working with copper is that it is a crystalline structure. And when you're working with any kind of crystalline structure, takes on energy and so when you work with this copper you should feel a little bit of happiness and joy and gratitude and all those wonderful things versus uh, going into this and being frustrated and angry and don't worry you can play with these things no matter what your what your triscale looks like in the end uh, they'll always be a helpful and beneficial and working tool now then again we hold the central spiral in our left hand and our other leg we bend up and towards where we're going. So central spiral, our first leg, and then our second leg, we bend it up and just keep rolling it into the center as well. you get towards the center, you can play around with this a bit. And you can row one up tighter than the other and get it so that all three legs are about the same length. And that is a Hedica Orchard Scale. Beautiful tool. Uh, please do your research and play with these guys. Enjoy. So much thanks to the Elders Three and to my sister Brenda, who has brought the Elders Three into this world. 
drift into my limbs, into feeling, into words. Feel your heart beat. Feel your heart beat with gaps in between where the qualities were steep. Feel your heart beat. Forgive the ego on this one, alright? <laughs> it goes lotus position, a head bobbing while you listen in. Starlight to sunshine and moonlight. I'm always listening, reflecting like my watch in seventh grade. I caught some spotlight. Now bleach the rising cones, twist the mentos up with a lot tight. I got a grip on a cup of flavor that I steadily sip. Filling up in time because the pace is at a drip. Drip, it's easy to get carried away. Just like a late night fridge rate. Nutritious and delicious, must be kicking it with the may. She tick me off if you're putting stock in the corporations. That one come and try to rip me off. The revolution is not televised. It's broadcast through you and I, my friends. Providence is alive. Keep it on the giving tip, and in this way we shine. The opening of the eyes and the palms facing to the sky. Unless you wish a limited can. There will be another video coming out this spring of 2012 that is going to discuss the creation of the tensor field generator, the Gaia sphere, and the tensor coil.